Hello athletes, this is Travis uh, coming back with another video and today's topic we are going to be talking about kind of nutrition, uh, particularly you know as it uh, pertains to your health uh, and then subsequently to your athletic performance which is going to be the focus of this channel. Um, but uh, I want to be clear that in this video I'm not going to be talking about kind of uh, exactly what you should be eating, what you shouldn't eat, or what your nutrition plan, you know eat this much of that food, eat that much of this food. My goal with this video is to kind of help uh, reframe how you you're thinking about food and nutrition to help you decide for yourself and understand for yourself what is the best thing for you to be eating in order to be healthy and to perform well all right because there is there is a lot of bad information out there there's a lot of misnomers out there and so I would like to kind of use kind of my experience and my extensive research on this subject to kind of help steer you pull you away from those kind of fallacies uh, so that you can think a little bit more clearly about uh, making your own decisions with regard to what food that you're putting in your body to be healthy and to perform. Now, there are certainly some broader rules that I believe that uh, you know are kind of universal for human nutrition, but I definitely don't believe that everybody should be eating these same foods in order to achieve their optimal health, all right? And we'll get into that a little bit and why I believe that and kind of how I think about it and how I think you should kind of step back and think about it to help guide your own decisions with regard to nutrition as we move through this video, all right? But this is going to be a lot of hypothesis, all right? And I say hypothesis because the one thing I really want to emphasize and to get people to understand is that there is really no such thing as nutrition science, all right? And I say that coming from the perspective of someone who has studied hard science, who went into college to study theoretical astrophysics, you know, was there for three semesters before my interest diverted to more coaching and uh, I ended up studying behavioral psychology and using that as a foundation for teaching. Um, but uh, there was certainly enough time studying hard science and exposure to hard science to understand the difference between science in the sense of uh, work that can be verified through rigorous experimentation and work such as say clinical psychology or social science or nutrition which is a lot of hypothesis and deductive reasoning all right and so when you read studies that are a nutrition study or they're talking about nutrition science all right almost exclusively that is going to be referring to epidemiological studies all right which is a simply mass surveys and then compiling and aggregating information from those surveys to come up with a result now the problem with studies like that when you're taking into account human beings is that there are so many different variables that you cannot control that it reduces the validity of that scientific result, all right? And I think that for us as people trying to find definitive, easy to understand answers, um, our tendency is to want to kind of dismiss complexity and embrace simplicity, all right? And these studies allow the public to do that and allow people to kind of make informed decisions about recommendations. But the problem is, is that uh, humans have such a broad genetic diversity that it is uh, a great disservice to the, anybody who is offering uh, broad recommendations for what you should eat, all right? And so I'm not gonna come into these, uh, this talk and any subsequent talks about this saying, this is what you should definitely eat. What I'm gonna talk about is things that I've learned and uh, the way I look at things and understand things and hopefully help guide you to kind of shift and to kind of understand how to analyze this data and make decisions uh, based on those insights and based on your own history. All right, and so we've talked about how the science is epidemiological, so a study. And so, you know, let's take an example uh, for a study and kind of break it down. And so if you have a study that's saying, you know, that tests, you know, a thousand people, and it's saying that, you know, we tested a thousand people and showed that uh, people who eat meat are more susceptible to uh, heart disease. All right, that's a popular one. So the problem with that is that in those studies, they're not going to differentiate between eating McDonald's hamburgers, you know, and eating a uh, prime cut sirloin, 
all right? And so it's just meat, all right? And there's gonna be a big difference between those two meats. One of which is going to include a lot of other stuff on the hamburger, another is actually true pure meat, all right? And so when you dig into these studies and you look at the actual research protocol and the conclusions and the statistical analysis that they run through in these studies, a lot of these conclusions break down and a lot of problems that we have with people's understanding of nutrition uh, in the public is that people get that information from articles and they don't get it from the scientific research all right and so they'll take it from an article that's saying hey there was a study and it came to this conclusion the problems with that being is there's they're almost exclusively going to be an agenda behind that article and then if you dig deeper there might even be an agenda behind the study and then if you dig deeper and actually read the study all right read the scientific research you know the protocols and outline the experiments you know and the and look at the survey that people were given um, <laughs> your perception of the validity of those conclusions really kind of uh, gets a new light shown upon it, all right? And so, and I would say 0.01% of the population that talks about nutrition and has firmly held beliefs and dogma about nutrition has actually read the scientific studies, has analyzed it, has studied it, the protocol, has looked at the experiments, understands how scientific experiments should be run, has looked at the data, understands statistical analysis enough to look at that and run it through and confirm the statistical validity of that information and then come to their own conclusions. And so we're very much reliant on highly biased um, information. And so you've got to pull away from that, all right? And I, I'm really a believer that you have got to disassociate yourself from relying exclusively on information that's coming from sources who are financially motivated for one decision over another, all right? And so that's kind of my perception on, on looking at the research. And so what do you say? Well, you're saying that there's no valid research that we can look at to determine this, all right? So what do you do? Well, what you do is you need to go to uh, self-experimentation and deductive reasoning in order to uh, come to these conclusions. Now, if we go into kind of my other core of my belief in terms of nutrition, uh, we're gonna go kind of more into an evolutionary perspective of understanding where humans came from, all right? So, Homo sapiens are about 100,000 to 300,000 years old, all right? That's how long we've been on this planet. The human species, all right, the Homo genus has been on the planet for uh, I think it's a couple, two and a half million years or something like that, all right? So that's a long period of time. And human civilization has only loosely existed for from five to 10,000 years with agriculture starting somewhere around the 15, maybe 20,000 year mark, depending on kind of what resources. But even if you go with that absolute maximum, all right? So that's, you know, humans started to domesticate plants about 20,000 years ago. Um, that is a snapshot in human evolution, all right? And that, you know, anyone that understands kind of uh, cultural influence on evolution, you know, can say that, you know, the, the simple Darwinian uh, kind of survival of the fittest idea, though that's not the, the most accurate kind of way to, to kind of uh, reference Darwin, but the idea of kind of the, the most dominant survival traits are going to uh, perpetuate through a species evolution, um, that starts to break down when you start to add in kind of human components, all right? Certainly the easiest thing to think is like, you know, the, the idea of romantic love and getting married and having families, you know, with that as your foundation, all right? That is not, the, the romantic love is no longer using, you know, what is the, the uh, most, um, what are the strongest traits for survival to determine who is having offspring and how much offspring that you're having, all right? And so, you know, the, the bulk of human evolution purely based on what was best for that organism, for that animal, in order to survive and perpetuate its genes, that really kind of came to an end around, you know, 15, 20,000 years ago. But prior to that, that you're talking about you know, over 90%, you know, if you're talking about just Homo sapiens and a very small fraction percent of our evolutionary uh, timeline, you know, contained within when we had human civilization. And so we can then look back and say, okay, well, then the foundation of our genetic code and what we need in order to survive was set, you know, back, you know, in that time period, all right? So it was set before we domesticated plane, 
plants when hunting you know and and consuming other animals was our primary form of nutrition when eating plants uh, and foraging was a supplementary form of, of nutrition and kind of a way to survive in the scarcity of of prey animals and then you can take that and then you can say okay well over the course of the last you know 15 20,000 years or even 10,000 years when humans started to kind of migrate out of Africa and started to go to a lot of different environments, um, then we were kind of exposed to different places where we're gonna draw our nutrition from, all right? And so you can't say that, you know, a human that in the last 10,000 years, their primary genetic heritage has come from, um, you know, a tropical environment versus uh, an Arctic environment versus, you know, say like a Pacific Islander versus someone whose ancestry is kind of, uh, you know, northern Siberia. You know, there's a lot of different adaptations that, that those populations have, have been forced to, um, to develop over those times in order to survive in those environments as they left Africa, all right? And so then things get more complicated because in, in very modern human history, we've truly become this melting pot, all right? And so, you know, 200 years ago, you're probably not gonna get someone who, from, from Siberia that's going to marry and have children with someone from a Pacific Island, all right? Whereas in the modern, you know, today, that can totally happen, all right? And so, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, it was very simple that people, you know, in that kind of Arctic climate would eat what it was in that Arctic climate, which is gonna be dominantly prey animals, all right? And, you know, there's no vegetables growing, you know, when it's uh, it's snow all year round on the ground, all right? And that, um, you know, people in the in the tropical islands, you know, they're going to be, have some kind of limitation in terms of their, their eating, depending on how available uh, fishing is, um, and but they are gonna have a lot more fruits available that they can supplement that and get carbohydrate for kind of that boost of energy. And so, um, so many different things. And so what happens in our modern culture is that there is so much genetic, genetic diversity that it's very hard to trace what food you are genetically um, adapted to eat based on, let's say, the last you know, 5, 10, 15, 20,000 years of your genetic ancestry. And we could probably pull it back even farther and just say the last couple thousand years, where are your ancestors from? What were they eating? What did they adapt to eat? You know, the people who were not well adapted to eating fruits, um, they died because, uh, you know, there wasn't modern health, you know, there wasn't enough stuff to keep them alive and vibrant. And so they died probably before they had kids. And the people who did have the genetic adaptations to take in those kinds of foods uh, were survived and they were able to continue on because that kind of food was available, all right? And so that comes into the trick of where we are now and what's happening. And so we can then talk about food in the sense of, you know, some other core beliefs that I have is that one, that there's kind of three tenets that I'll tell people as a coach for nutrition, all right? And, and one, and I'll go through those tenants there so that you can kind of kind of you know understand so that you can kind of take away a little bit of do's and don'ts for this, all right? And the first one is water is the only thing that you need to drink, all right? You know, at no point did we need, you know, coffees, teas whatsoever to be healthy, all right? So we definitely evolved for water. Anything else is a supplement. It may be an herbal supplement if you feel like it kind of, you know, makes me feel better, you know, or more relaxed or whatever it may be. Uh, for coffee, if you need that to get through the day, that's fine, um, assuming that you're well adapted to that. Though I, I would argue that things like coffee and tea, a lot of people aren't well suited to that and it can cause problems. But the reality is, is that you do not need that. That is not a health then something that you need for health. You don't need juice in order to be healthy. All you need is water. All right, and preferably you're getting water from a natural source, uh, which a very, very small percent of us are gonna be able to do. And I say that because uh, water from a stream, from a fresh stream is gonna have a lot of the kind of uh, minerals that we need in order to thrive as human beings. Whereas a lot of that stuff is filtered out of the bottled water or even the tap water that we consume now. All right, so water is important, but that, that part about you know it not being natural kind of stream water um, is, uh, uh, is going to come into play later in terms of do you need to kind of supplement your diet with various things, all right? And the answer is probably going to be if it was pulled out of your water supply because of filtering, then you need to get it back in the body somehow, all right? The other rule is that 
if the food could not be produced without modern technology, don't eat it. All right, uh, there, there's so much that is put into food in order to preserve it uh, that is just not great for humans. All right, and it could be okay with, for some people. All right, there's certainly nothing that's put in there that is necessary for you to survive and be healthy. All right, everything that we need to survive and be healthy can be found in our local environment. If that wasn't the case, you know, our ancestors 30,000 years ago and longer would have died. All right, but um, so nothing that's, you know, um, nothing that any company is going to put into your food is going to be better than finding the right natural food and eating that. All right, and so that was, if it can't be made by modern manufacturing techniques, then don't eat it, all right? And then related to that is that if the ingredients in your food are not food themselves, do not eat it, all right? And so if you're looking at the back of your label, you're looking at tomato sauce, for instance, all right? And it says tomatoes and water and maybe some spices, you're good. If you look at the back of the tomato sauce and it has bunches of chemicals and stuff that you would like, well, I'm not going to eat that, you know, alone, you know, as its own ingredient, then you should not be eating that food, all right, because it's still getting into your system, all right? And so those are my three rules, all right? For optimal nutrition, that's where you start. Drink only water. Uh, don't eat food that couldn't be produced, uh, you know, several hundred years ago without modern technology. And three, don't eat any food that contains ingredients that you would not eat individually on your own or could not eat individually on your own. All right, and then what's the next kind of takeaway? The next thing I want you, you thinking about is that any human pre-civilization with a chronic health condition would very quickly die, all right? And so I do not believe all right, that chronic health conditions are a normal part of kind of human existence, all right? Whether that is, you know, allergies, whether that is sinuses, whether that is, you know, skin issues, whether that is fatigue, insomnia, whether that is arthritis, whether that, whatever it might be, you know, these chronic health conditions, all right, if they are not something that, you know, a, a pre-civilization human could survive with, then there's something else contributing to that, all right? And in a lot of cases, I believe that ties back to the food that we're eating, all right? It ties back to the fact that you are probably consuming a food that your genetic history has not had the time to properly adapt to. All right, and this is where the problems come in with people comparing what they eat to what other people eat. Um, is that you have to be really, uh, you have to be really careful doing that. All right, because somebody could have a very different genetic heritage from the last couple thousand years than you do. You know, their genetic code could be far more adapted to getting carbohydrates through fruit, you know, versus yours. They're, they may be far more adapted to getting to metabolizing sugars, um, you know, consume sugars than you are, all right? And especially with things like obesity, you'll hear a lot of people say that obesity is kind of a genetic uh, condition that, that some family might be predisposed to uh, retaining weight, you know, in a negative way. Um, I definitely have a theory about that, that I believe that, that obesity is not itself genetic, that obesity is a sign of someone who, of a family, uh, who have a genetic trait, that they are not, uh, they have not adapted to modern food, all right? And because people are, are so inundated with modern food and that's all they have available, um, that those people who have failed, you know, their family, their lineage has failed to make that adaptation to modern food, that they are going to, as a family, be predisposed to obesity, all right? You know, especially things like, you know, sugars, carbohydrates, you know, sugars are very modern, part of uh, our food. You know, they were certainly not outside of eating, you know, random fruit when it was in season, assuming it was an edible fruit. Um, other than that, you know, outside of modern society, things like sugarcane, those are very modern. And even kind of, if you go back hundreds of years, those were a very exclusive thing. They were certainly not something that you had access to on a daily basis. And so I do believe that uh, obesity is very much tied to uh, people's 
lack of genetic, full genetic adaptation to metabolizing things like carbohydrates and sugars, consume carbohydrates and sugars uh, effectively, all right? And so, and that is, you know, tied in a lot to the decisions that I've made with food to bring myself to a healthy spot. And I can talk about that in another video, but I'm mainly trying to get you guys to kind of think about food in a different way with this video. All right, and so then what is the answer? All right, and the answer is you have got to kind of break out of this, this dogma of you know this magazine or this book or this expert or this doctor has told me to eat in this way. If you have any kind of chronic health conditions, if you, you know, can say if I were kind of transported 30,000 years ago into the wild and let's assume that you know I had a matrix download of all the hunting skills and gathering skills that I would need in order to survive in that environment you know if you taking your current health don't think that you could survive you know if you were plopped in that situation again you have the matrix download all right you have all the knowledge information and skill set of a human being from 30,000 years ago you know if you have some residual health conditions that would stop you from surviving whether it's, you know, bad knees, bad joints, bad ankles, bad back, you know, whether it's chronic fatigue, whether it's, you know, you snore really loud, so you're going to get eaten at night, you know, all those things. If you have any of those things, then you should start to experiment with, with food and what you're eating, all right? And now I will debunk some myths that are kind of common out there, one of which being that you need a diverse diet in order to be healthy, all right? That is very not true, all right? Is uh, if you can, if you're telling me that you need a diverse diet, let's say you need, you you know, a couple different kinds of fruits every day, you need several different kinds of vegetables every day, you need a bunch of grains every day, you know, in order to have this, you know, ideal optimal diet, all right? And so you go back again, you know, the whole base of the video is that you have to trust in the, the concept of, of evolution and, uh, and human health and the fact that, you know, our ancestors tens, more than tens of thousands of years ago, the bodies that came out of that selection environment are the foundation of where we are. If you don't believe that, then I can't help you in this video. But let's go back and say, all right, we could even go a couple hundred years back and then you're telling me that you need to eat fruits and vegetables that come from all different points of the country and possibly the globe and are imported to your local station, you know, that you need those in order to be healthy and to survive, that is just absolute bull, all right? And so you go a couple hundred years ago, you are gonna eat what is in your local environment, all right? And so if what you're, is in your local environment cannot generate optimal health, then you would have died, all right? And so this idea that you need, you know, um, that you need bananas from some tropical thing, I mean, banana is a whole different thing because ban and bonner bananas look nothing like, you know, ancient bananas, all right? And so that's another thing is that most of our modern food looks nothing like the food that we would have had access to hundreds of years ago, or thousands of years ago, much less tens of thousands of years ago, and food that, you know, would have made us healthy, all right? So that's another part of, you know, the whole modern food of my three tenets of don't eat anything that you couldn't have eaten a couple hundred years ago. But just the idea that in order to be healthy, you would need this food that you now currently need to source from all kinds of different locations that you could not have gotten from your immediate environment a couple hundred years ago before modern technology if you assume that just everybody you know hundreds of years ago thousands of years ago were all unhealthy um i think that's that's absurd all right certainly our health because our medicine has improved in sanitation but uh, that's not the case just in general in terms of all food, all right? There's lots of very healthy people and the only healthy people from back then weren't the people who could get food beyond their immediate environment, all right? That is just not true, all right? You can use deductive reasoning to kind of think your way through that one, all right? And so, so yes, yeah, so one, all these different food, you don't need diversity in your diets, all right? You need to kind of, you know, dial in and, and figure out what you need, all right? Certainly, you know, coming from getting meat from other animals, you know, you know, when you're eating, you are taking molecules from something else, mashing them up, putting them in your body so that your body can then use those molecules to make its own molecules and then continue on with life, all right? And so the 
the closest molecules that you're going to eat that are going to help with that with that nutrition are going to be other animals all right that's why anybody that goes in the wild you know can survive on eating other animals all right because eating other animals putting those those molecules in your body uh, and then turning them into the molecules that you need in order to survive it is the easiest metabolic way to go all right then the supplement that if you're in absence or if there's not a lot of you know animal meat meat available for you to eat then fortunately humans are also omnivores, all right? We have developed an ability to consume some kind of vegetation or fruits, you know, and use those to get by. Now, I don't believe those are ideal. I don't believe you should survive solely on those. I do believe that the core should be meat. Um, you're definitely getting into dogma there. That's a whole different video. But the reality is, is that the takeaway is, is that understand that process, all right? You are taking molecules from something else you are consuming them and turning those molecules in what you need to survive. And when you're consuming plants, you're hoping that that plant hasn't developed an adaptation to stop you from eating it, whether it's toxic, whether it's, you know, just inedible in general. Whereas animals, you know, 99.9% .9 of animals are edible, 99.9% .9 of vegetation and plants are inedible. So take that as a hint of what is our bodies are probably most adapted to eat. We're, we're adapted to eat what is available to us and not what is unavailable to us. But I do feel like I'm starting to kind of go on too many tangents here and get away from the core of this video, which was to try to encourage you to think about food and nutrition in a different way, all right, for your health, for your performance. Because if you are not eating the right food, uh, then that is gonna be your first failure. And then once you figure out what is the food that you feel best with through experimentation, then you make sure you need to eat enough of it all right to cover your caloric needs as an athlete all right you know and that's that's a key thing that i found with my athletes um especially my higher performance athletes is that just didn't eat enough all right they were still eating at a quantity that was similar maybe a little higher than kind of a normal person whereas they had a very much abnormal uh energy expenditure on any daily basis all right but uh but that's it so that's been kind of like my long lecture to talk about kind of ideas hypothesis about food and nutrition and health hopefully it will spark you guys to think about things in a different way to kind of get out of that dogma of listening to these uh these scientific studies certainly don't listen to articles that are just talking about a scientific study all right you're getting information three times removed from the actual source um you know if you want to kind of rely on on scientific research for it make sure you are taking the time making the investment to read the scientific literature itself all right stop reading summary articles stop reading magazines about health and nutrition go find the science read the science understand the experiment you know decide for yourself whether you believe that it's valid that it's worthy of your trust and investment in the future of what you're going to do with your health and nutrition um, and if it's not ignore it move on all right and also lastly you know for me and my personal uh belief is use deductive reasoning rely on the de deductive reasoning i i don't think that you can use experiments human beings cannot be experimented on all right you cannot have you cannot have fixed uh variables you know you can't have your distinct dependent and dependent variables with human beings because you cannot control them like that and so any science that is, is claims to be science that is uh, on human beings, whether it's nutrition science, whether it's exercise science, whether it's psychology, you know, you need to come in with a great deal of skepticism, all right? Because you, know, you cannot lock a human in the room, eliminate all these extraneous variables, and just focus on the variables that you want to analyze for that experiment. It just can't be done, all right? And so true science cannot be applied to human beings with our current technology. It is just impossible. Stop listening to people who are trying to tell you that it can. Stop listening to people that are telling you that soft science or fake science or epidemiology or hypotheses without, you know, vigorous testing is a suitable replacement for real hard science, all right? You can take that as a guide for your own hypotheses, but don't take it as fact. Don't take it as theory. And that's it, all right? I've talked a lot. 
I hope you found this helpful. I hope it kind of got your brain thinking about things in a new way, you know, ready to ask questions. Shoot those questions down below in the comments if you have them. I'm happy to kind of engage and answer these. I'm happy to make more videos about this. Um, I'm happy to talk about my own experience and my own journey kind of with health and nutrition because there's certainly a lot to talk about there as well. But in the meantime, here's some stuff to chew on. Enjoy, subscribe to the channel if you found this helpful and you want more like it. And uh, definitely check out GTS Rowing if you are looking for some actual athletic training, even though we didn't really talk about athletic training in this video. But that's it, this is Travis. Thanks again, and we'll catch you on the next video. Bye.